Great. Hello, hello, everybody. We made it to October, and you know what October is, right? It is Manufacturing Month, and we have a great group of passionate and involved leaders lined up to share with you today strategies that they are using in the automation and upskilling space in their businesses. My name is Jessica Miller, and I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and we are so very happy to have you with us today. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. If you're returning, thank you for coming back again. Each October, we take the opportunity to celebrate our manufacturers and the powerful impact that they have on our Minnesota economy. Not only is our session today focused on automation and upskilling your workforce, but we have events all month long that give our youth our job seekers, our career changers, and our community members the opportunity to learn more about manufacturing and see what's being made right in our own backyards through facility tours and panel discussions, job fairs, and more. Look for a link in the chat for information about these events, and if you're interested in participating in next year's activities, please reach out to any of the Workforce Strategy Consultants, and they will be happy to help. We are swiftly moving through our year's lineup of topics, which means we are hard at work at planning our Workforce Wednesday sessions for next year. So if you wouldn't mind, take a second, introduce yourself in chat if you haven't done so yet, and let us know a workforce topic that you would like to see us cover for next year. Our session today will go until 12, after which we will segue into our 30-minute unplugged portion of the event, where we invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself, and ask questions of our panelists, as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants verbally or through chat, whichever your preference is. I would also like to take a moment to encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end of our time here together today. We will get that link popped into the chat for you at various times throughout this session as well. As always, these webinars are recorded and available to view at any time via YouTube, as well as our careerforcemn.com website, where you will also find recordings and resources from this session, as well as all of our previous sessions. We will be utilizing our chat feature today throughout our time together. Please ask questions, answer questions, and interact with our guests, consultants, partners, and each other. We really want to build upon the community that we've started here, and we welcome your engagement. Our team of consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on the region that they're working in and the employers that they're serving in those regions. But the common core ways that we support our employers are identified here. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies, ensure that you're connected with your local, regional, and state workforce partners, and we assist you in building upon these strategies that will help you attract and retain workforce. When you work with us, you're automatically connected to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive. We do not do this work alone. It takes many people to bring success to these efforts and you'll see them around that wheel. I know that we have a packed agenda today with some amazing guests. So without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce you to our D Commissioner, Matt Verilek. All right, thank you very much, Jessica, and thanks everyone for being here today. It's a little disconcerting looking at my own face more than once on the screen. Uh, sorry to subject you to it, uh, but I am very excited to be with you all. I do have the honor of serving as commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development here. Started on June 20th, so I'm in my fourth month and very excited that now I get to join my first Workforce Wednesday discussion. But I will say that um, this is the first time speaking at one. I have been a consumer of them in the past and have found these uh, very useful, and I'm glad that you all do as well. So this month's topic is an important one, obviously, and that is growing our manufacturing workforce and helping to upskill our workers all year round, but especially during Manufacturing Month. And incidentally, last month was Workforce Development Month, and so this is really a nice pairing. And since we're um, only a couple days or four days, I guess, into October, uh, very nice combination. 
So Manufacturing Month is a month-long celebration in Minnesota with a proclamation from the governor. Uh, we've got lots of resources, flyers, videos, and other information that can be found on the Career Force website, which I think we will share maybe in the chat or something like that. Uh, we've got lots of tours, community events, virtual magazines, et cetera, available, including bus funding to help ensure that students can visit sites and events to learn about these career opportunities. Uh, I think the website, incidentally, is um, careerforcemn.com slash manufacturing. So now to set the stage for our discussion today, I wanted to share a little bit about the current state of manufacturing in Minnesota. Now, I know you all know uh, how it looks from your corner of the world, and you, you certainly have expertise that I don't, but I wanted to share at a high level statistically uh, how the industry looks. Um, needless to say, the manufacturing industry is critically important to our Minnesota economy and the, the structurally diverse economy that we have. Manufacturing contributed $58.7 billion to the state's economy in 2022. Uh, obviously, it produces a wide range of products that improve people's lives around the world, everything from medical devices to food to recreational vehicles and everything in between. Workers in the industry took home $24.9 billion in wages from Minnesota manufacturing jobs last year, and the average annual wage was $76,950 which is 10% higher than the state's overall average private sector wage, which of course makes this a very attractive industry. Um, demand for people to work in this sector is very high now, and we expect that we'll be in the future, which of course makes it also a strong career path choice for young people that are deciding uh, what direction to go, and in fact, for people at any age. Uh, we expect to see more than 75,000 job openings for manufacturing production positions alone through 2030. Uh, and as we look out into the future, according to our um, Labor Market Information Office at DEED, by 2048, uh, Minnesota's overall population is expected to increase by 10.5%. And within that overall growth, dog barking in the background here, uh, within that overall growth, it's worth noting that the largest increases are among Minnesotans who are Black, Indigenous, or persons of color. Um, and when it comes to the manufacturing workforce demographics, uh, we would note that 82.7% are white compared to all industries at 84.2%. So 82.7 and 84.2. And then uh, when it comes to gender, 69.6% .6 are male compared to 49.3% male in the economy as a whole. So, that set of statistics provides a little additional economic and demographic context for the current state of the industry in Minnesota. I'll add that you don't need to be a demographer or an economist or other expert to know that the Minnesota manufacturing sector is very strong and is eager to hire more talented workers than you can currently find, uh, which brings us to some of the ways that DEED is working with a variety of partners to help manufacturing as well as other key sectors to address this need. And as we mentioned, last month was Workforce Development Month, and so we've been talking about this topic even more than usual. Um, so for years now, I would say the governor and other leaders have been making the case that we need to be making bigger investments in the workforce of the future. And at last, in the most recent legislative session, uh, significant investments of that kind were allocated. Uh, specifically, the governor signed legislation investing $20 million this biennium to support what we call the Drive for Five Workforce Fund. So this initiative will address some of the state's job vacancy challenges by creating a pipeline of workers who are skilled and prepared to enter five of the most critical occupational categories in the state uh, with high growth jobs and family sustaining wages, namely technology, caring professions, education, trades, and last but not least, manufacturing. Uh, and this initiative also includes specific investments in populations that face the biggest barriers to employment, again, including uh, persons of color, potentially people with disabilities uh, and others facing systemic barriers. And so if Minnesota is to remain globally competitive, if we're going to help manufacturers and other industries attract the top talent they need, we're going to have to build a workforce that makes companies uh, that helps companies move or expand. Uh, we need to look at our workforce needs over the next decade. And so Drive for Five will focus workforce training efforts on industries with high demand and high wages, as I mentioned. Uh, the state will align workforce training efforts with business demands and create partnerships between businesses, trade associations, and workforce training programs 
to help connect people who have been prepared for employment in those five fields with open positions in those fields. And the program focuses on helping workers who have been often overlooked. So all in all, we hope to create a pipeline of workers skilled and prepared to enter these high growth and high wage sectors uh, and to address Minnesota's high job vacancy rate. Uh, and we'll do so in sectors that have an outsized impact on the economy. And uh, finally, I'm pleased to report that we'll be launching Drive for Five in just a matter of days uh, with a request for proposals. So keep your eyes out for that information. Um, moving on now, I would say Minnesota's workforce shortage requires a variety of strategies, including what I just said, but also others. Um, we know that the, the labor shortage makes it hard for business owners to find the, the labor you need right now. And even as we launch Drive for Five, we're also continuing to help manufacturers with automation. Uh, manufacturers tell us all the time that automation can help expand productivity, increase precision, and maximize output while you also work overtime to recruit employees. And so last year, Deed launched an automation loan participation program, which is going to help small manufacturers uh, implement automation to help them innovate, grow, and succeed. As part of the program, we make companion loans to help small business purchase small businesses to purchase machinery, equipment, or software to increase productivity and automation. Uh, we know companies are ordering more robots than ever, uh, with 2022 being a record year and North American companies ordering more than 44,000 of them. Uh, the global industrial automation market was worth $189.7 billion in 2021, and it's predicted to be worth 440, rather $430.9 billion by 2030. So that's 10% uh, growth annually this decade. So automation is going to help drive business growth this decade, and it's important that we help Minnesota companies get in on the ground floor. So all in all, at Deed, we are excited to work with all of you to help keep manufacturing growing and expanding through automation, upskilling, and uh, fostering a diverse and inclusive workforce. And today we are very excited to have some excellent guests who will share more about how they are putting all these strategies to work, helping their businesses take off and their workers to succeed. So. At this point, I would like to welcome each of the panelists and share some about their background, and then I'm sure they uh, will share more as we go on and get into the topics of substance. Um, but I'll start off by welcoming Andy Wells, a member of the Red Lake Nation, who began Wells Technology in Bemidji as a fastener manufacturing business in 1985. Andy, by the way, I think we got to be together, I want to say, in Onamia uh, a few months back, so good to be with you. Um, yep. Growing your workforce became more difficult each year as your business uh, succeeded with patents, products, and services. By 2005, Andy was hiring uh, and training employment-challenged individuals, uh, in quotation marks. His innovative apprentice job training program has successfully helped to build his workforce for uh, the industry and provide economic stability for employees and their families. Andy currently has 46 employees, with more than one quarter being Native American. So big welcome to Andy. Well, thank you for the introduction and to everybody for attending. Uh, it's been quite a challenge uh, up here in northern Minnesota to uh, grow a manufacturing workforce, especially because we're kind of on the high tech side with a lot of advanced um, computer control equipment. And uh, when we do have a need to grow and add employees, we put ads in the paper and other media like many of you do too. Uh, but oftentimes we get no qualified applicants, and that is uh, there aren't anybody who applies who really has related job experience or the education and advanced skills we look for. But what we do get are a lot of folks who come in who are basically just looking for a job. And, um, you know, they're, they're here, they have the desire to work. Uh, as we talk to them, we can tell they're sincere, they really want to. Uh, and so we decided to change our traditional ways of hiring uh, and instead of looking for achievement, we would go beyond that and look for the potential to achieve. And with that, we uh, began working with uh, training. We'd bring them on board, we'd hire them, we'd pay them a minimum wage of $15 an hour to get started. And uh, we would assign a mentor to them so that they had sort of like a big brother or a big sister internally. Uh, and that was really important because a lot of them have a different culture uh, up here. Uh, for us, it was Native Americans quite often, but it could be other cultures and other communities. Uh, but that culture adjustment uh, to an industry setting is kind of a, a big step for a lot of these folks. 
And uh, we address that by using a mentor and uh, helping them with that aspect of uh, adjustment as well as the technical skills through an instructor. And uh, we began to uh, bring these folks on board and it turned out to be a successful endeavor. So uh, that's where we are still doing successfully. Excellent. Well, thanks, Andy, for the kind of introductory overview comments. And um, to the other panelists, I think what I'll do is proceed now and, and share about each of your backgrounds. And if you want to make similar comments to that off the top, and then once we get through everybody, I'll have a few questions for individuals of you. And then I don't know if there's also room to take questions from other uh, participants as well, but hopefully someone will flag those for me. So we'll go next to Lynn. Uh, Lynn Bakken is the Human Resources Manager at uh, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative in Renville with 400 full-time plant employees and 330 seasonal harvest employees in September and October. Lynn is utilizing his prior HR experience with JBS in Worthington and High Life Foods in Wyndham to help SMBSC build an infrastructure that will support long-term hiring and retention of an ethnically diverse workforce. Thank you for joining us, Len, and uh, would invite you to share any introductory overview comments. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my experience mostly has been with uh, diversity and inclusion. So starting my uh, uh, my main job at JBS was several years ago, 2,200 employees, 67 different languages or dialects, and it, and it was really about making career paths or career ladders for folks that are there. Um, it was it was recognizing all of the different languages, breaking down the barriers so that somebody could learn English a little bit better and become a supervisor and a manager. Um, we did a lot of work in that. Um, but also, you know, your employees are your best recruiters. Oh, hey, Len, you just got muted for some reason. Oh, sorry. There we go, you're back. Not sure where I left off, but uh, you know, as we all know, our employees are our best recruiters. And so as we gotta become an employer of choice, no matter where we live, we've got to uh, it's make it the best place to work and the best place to live. We've gotta have career ladders. And that's been a lot of the work um, that I've done. And I understand the value and understand how big of a workforce there is out there of folks that are not completely bilingual. And it's, it's uh, breaking down those barriers so that you do not have to speak English in order to get a job. That's where I'm at with SMBSC. I have started here four months ago. Um, one of the barriers here is you do need to speak English. And so I'm putting my experience to the test to make this a place that we, we can break down those barriers, build an infrastructure that allows a much larger pipeline to be available for us for, as a workforce. Excellent. Thank you very much. By the way, I'm struck as you're talking and just knowing where we have people attending from. Um, it's always more fun to be together in person, but it also is pretty nice that uh, none of us had to travel uh, to take part in this statewide conversation. Um, next up, let's go to Jasmine Sunmore, uh, president and CEO of Aura Fabricators, a metal fabricator in Dalton. Aura Fabricators is a certified disadvantaged business enterprise owned and operated uh, by a minority and woman owner. Jasmine has 45 employees. Uh, Jasmine received the Sue Cronin Vanguard Golden Shovel Award given to women pioneers in business and construction. She volunteers time, experience, and resources to champion access to quality health care, future workforce development, other entrepreneurs, and general community business growth and expansion. And she lives in Fergus Falls with her two boys. Welcome, Jasmine. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it says that I volunteer time and experience and whatnot. And a lot of what I'll speak today is how that might seem like fluff, like fluffy initiatives to spend extra time on when we're always busy as business professionals. Um, but what I've found is that it pays dividends over time and time again. And I'll get into that later. But um, I stay heavily uh, involved in volunteer work that I feel encompasses both my future growth of my business, but also um, helps the community grow uh, around my my business. Um, you know, it's it's easy when we talk workforce that it 
can be an us versus them when it comes to other businesses competing for um, people to work for you. Um, but what I've found is that if you just your community gets to be a better place, you can attract more people into the community as well. Um, so uh, I guess all that being said, I get involved on the high school level. I'm the industry chair for um, the Fergus Falls High School Manufacturing Man Manufacturing Advisory Committee. Um, so that that has been nice to be kind of on the ground level of um, in impacting. Um, any decisions or um, direction that these children are really putting their focus to so that they can be the best asset they can be when they get into the workforce. Um, I'm vice chair and director of a local economic development group called Greater Fergus Falls. Um, so from that, I'm able to work with other entrepreneurs and help them with learning without going through the hard stuff, <laughs> you know, um, you know, I've been through uh, a business, uh, starting a business, uh, an expansion. I'm all, I also have a small retail cannabis store in Fergus Falls too, which has its own set of problems, um, unique to you know changing regulations and employment and things like that as well. Um, but I also volunteer my time as a director for the local hospitals foundation. So. Um, that all doesn't seem necessarily related, but to me, they're pillars of the community when it comes to like healthcare, um, education, um, they're true parts of our infrastructure. And therefore, um, that is why I spend additional time, um, in those initiatives. Great. Thank you, Jasmine. And that, that sounds like a lot. You must have a busy calendar and you must be good at keeping track of when you're supposed to be where. And uh, we appreciate you being here today and sharing your wisdom with us. Next, let's go to Val Bentdahl, Director of Operations and HR at Jones Metal Incorporated in Mankato. Val has been with the organization for almost 10 years and has worked in manufacturing for 18 years with a focus on HR and industrial safety. This past May, Val received a master's in human resources and industrial relations. Founded in 1942 by Mildred M. Jones as Jones Sheet Metal and Roofing Company, 81 years later, the company continues to be locally owned and woman run, now as a custom metal fabricator. The company has 85 employees, and we thank you for joining us, Val. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here today to kind of talk to um, some of the initiatives we've taken at Jones to ensure that we, um, you know, building a pipeline of employees in manufacturing and um, how we support manufacturing locally. Um, I too sit on the advisory councils for our high school as well as our um, local technical college or community college um, in Mankato. And I also serve on the um, workforce council for um, Southern Minnesota, South Central Minnesota. So thank you for having me. You bet. And th thank you as well for your time, um, given that you are a busy person. And then finally, for our panelists, I'll introduce Lance Lewis. And Lance, it was great to be with you recently in uh, St. Cloud. Uh, Lance has been president and CEO of Lewis Industries since 1998. Lewis Industries was started by Lance's grandfather in 1940 in Painesville. And it is leading a leading sheet metal fabricator in the upper Midwest. They currently have 90 employees with 40% of their leadership team and 50% of their sales team being women. As a family-run business, they pride themselves on a basic set of core values, long-term strategic planning for success, a dedicated workforce employed for life. So welcome, Lance. Oh, yeah, thanks, Matt. And I, I think I'd, I'd lead off kind of the, the discussion here saying one of the greatest things about being in manufacturing is, is we're not a cookie-cutter industry. We do many things, many things that are unique. Um, so lots of companies can do lots of different things, lots of skill sets, lots of different people. So when we get into these workforce conversations, the, the sky's the limit with with doing things to attract people. What I would what I would focus on is is being in rural Minnesota is unique and different than being in the metro. Being in rural Minnesota, sandwiched between bigger towns in rural Minnesota, makes it even more challenging. So, um trying to get our message out, you know, who Lewis Industries is, what we've done, and how we've evolved. 
the story I like to tell is people still think we're a, a dark, dirty, dingy welding shop that that is stuck in the 1940s when when in fact you know we've got some of the the greatest technology that's produced in the world hidden away in rural Minnesota. Um, we've got some of the the best employees stashed away in rural Minnesota. A lot of them, you know, choose to live out here because of the lifestyle and to to marry the people that want to live out here with a lifestyle with the technology and, and, and things we can do is it's really what makes this all work. And, and that's what's exciting and, and that's what helps drive us to do what we do. Excellent. Thank you. So with that, and now everyone having been introduced, let's go to kind of our discussion section. And I do have a few questions that I would pose to our panelists. Uh, and then panelists, I think it's always nice if, if we can have a somewhat of a conversational style here. So if any of you uh, would like to either chime in with a, a comment or a question based on what you're hearing, um, feel free to do that, please. Uh, as far as a, a first question to get us going, Andy, starting with you, um, one thing I understand is that you have um, been an innovator uh, in the sense of holding numerous patents. You've also done a lot of major contract work, I think, with Lockheed Martin, DOD, and NASA, et cetera. Um, so what could you share about the innovation process or tapping into contracting opportunities, or maybe those two are connected? Well, I think if you're going to go out and do business with large corporations today uh, and bring that business back home to uh, the workforce here in Minnesota, uh, we need to look at what they're really looking for. And we have a younger generation now that's doing the purchasing and management, uh, and they have a little bit different value system. Uh, I'm from the older generation that looked highly at profits and made a lot of decisions based on that. But the younger group is looking beyond that and looking also at things like environment and social justice and things that go into making a business not only successful, but happy and sustainable. Uh, and so when we go out and, and present our business to uh, these big corporations and talk about the things we can manufacture, we also talk about what we're doing for the environment. For example, our factory is run by solar, solar trackers that we manufacture right here. We design them and manufacture them, and now our plant runs by solar. And uh, they like that concept that uh, they're getting products that were made with a kind of a minimal amount of carbon energy. But they also like the social justice part. You know, what are you doing for your community? What value are you bringing to them? And so we talk about how we invest some of our profits back into the training to build our workforce and to give people who never really would have probably qualified for employment. Uh, we give them a new opportunity to uh, come on board and to be part of our system and part of our team and bring them on speed so they can run some of this new equipment and, and be a productive part of our group and our community. There's one other thing too, I would add that uh, this doesn't just stay within the factories or manufacturing that we have and that we represent here today from our different companies. Uh, it spreads out into community. We become a model. And when they see us building a workforce using some of the folks that have traditionally been left behind, um, when they see us building the workforce with those folks uh, and training them, um, they realize that maybe they can do that too. And I saw it here with our local hospital, uh, and uh, we were hiring Native American people who sometimes they dropped out of high school or other situations, uh, and we were making them very successful employees by the apprentice program. And they began to realize they could do this too. And uh, so now they're getting started in this kind of a thing. So it really, uh, it's beyond our own companies. It spreads out through our community when we take these positive steps. Excellent, thank you. Well, that, that sounds like an um, encouraging success story for others to emulate. Any other panelists have commentary there? I mean, one thing that I heard from Andy was the notion of kind of appealing to the interests and values of the young people you're trying to attract. Um, any Any other observations on that subject? Maybe how you've done it. I know some of you mentioned, and this relates to the topic of community engagement as well, interaction at the high school level and so forth. 
Yeah, as far as like the high school level, you know, I mentioned that I I am part of the advisory team for the local high school, but obviously that's not much engagement with the children themselves. So um, once or twice a year, I'm usually invited into um, actually being able to teach at the high school, and it's usually a very universal, um, essentially employability lesson. Um, the last time I spoke, it was on problem solving critical thinking and initiative. Um, I mean, those are, that sounds like simple things, but um, it still doesn't mean much. Those words don't mean much unless you can really apply it to how you can take that out into the workforce and use it. Um, so that really give, gives me the opportunity to almost like showcase my company, um, but also give real world examples that I learned the hard way or even just saying like what I look for in an employee, um, how you can really set yourself up to, even if you don't have an education, um, prove that you know, you're worth it for the additional training and that you're an asset to be essentially um, grown. Um, this last year, we had the opportunity to uh, get involved in the youth skills training program. Um, which allows um, teens to intern at companies in positions that they typically wouldn't have access to being able to train in. Um, we had a welder last year and it worked out phenomenally. Uh, he right away pretty much told us that, you know, I, I could see this being my career. Um, and I said, great, you know, like, let, whatever you need to do, however you want to grow in this company, you let me know. We'll put you in the right spots. If you want to work into the robotics, we'll let you know um, how you can do that. And uh, in the summer, we had another part-time employee. And since then, he's found time to come in um, after his college courses to put in a few hours of work. Um, so I think it gives a firsthand approach to not only allow um, the younger generation to get um, hands-on experience, but also to um, prove that, yes, we're not a, you know, dingy, dirty industry anymore, that there's a lot of automation, there's a lot of good things happening, that this can be a career, and there's a lot of growth opportunities. I think, yeah, that's uh, great. Oh, oh, please go ahead. Matt, I'd just, I'd piggyback on Jasmine a little bit, and I think, you know, being part of the Center of Minnesota Manufacturers Board of Directors, one of the things we we see a lot is 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 people don't know how to ask the questions. People don't know who to who to go to within a company to get advice. And just trying to trying to connect people, trying to break down that that barrier of not understanding. You know, the, how do you get a tour in this place? How do you connect a school with another kid? Um, so the Central Minnesota Manufacturers Association actually developed a, a tool called the K twelve Navigator to try to connect business to education and then the individual people looking to get into this 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 field and again manufacturing is so amazing and the, and the stuff we get to play with and the challenge is getting people to see what manufacturers do and not being scared to go beyond that that wall so getting the youth skills training lewis industries is a certified youth apprentice facility so we can take in you know 16 year old kids and have them work on the on the plant floor andy talked about the the generational change the the young kids aren't scared of software and computers they're they, they come in day one and if they don't use it they wonder what's going on and the older generation has always taken the time to become an expert and, and put in a lifetime of dedication. And when you can marry those things together, you, you see just a, a ton of magic happen and, and you see those light bulbs turn on for the for the kids. And, and that's when they they become super curious and and they're they're just they just rock it to the next level, not only in school, but but what these careers can offer them. That's great. And I don't know if it was Jasmine who said earlier something about almost like rebutting the notion that this community engagement stuff is fluff. I think you all are talking about some of the concrete benefits that you've seen as business leaders with allocating time to that engagement. Do you ever get any pushback though? Do people say, hey, why are you why are you doing anything other than spending time on the shop floor? Yes, but um, I think the biggest thing is uh, getting the message across um, to the rest of your team as far as how that actually does benefit 
um, maybe projects that have come um, to fruition that you might not have been part of the conversation for, um, but because you're part of the community, the community wants you to be involved in certain projects or things like that. Um, I, I even give an example from during COVID time when the restaurants all had shut down um, eating in, you had to only do takeout options. Uh, a lot of the restaurants, I was worried about my community, um, you know, that the, the restaurants would not survive past this. Um, so as a team, we pledged that we would um, purchase a meal from a different restaurant every week. Um, this obviously was good for employee morale. They got a free meal once a week, but also it made a huge and lasting impact in the community. Um, it created a ripple effect where people were talking about it um, because these are large orders that these small restaurants and businesses might not have had otherwise. Um, and it, it seems like such a small thing, but it's just like these little, they're not meant to be marketing things, but it just proves that you're really tied in the community, that you really care about the people around you. And, and um, you have to remember that your team is also tied to the community and they have family members, they have friends that benefited from these actions. Um, so it all just kind of all comes back. And I, like I said, it seems fluffy, but it really isn't when you get down to the, the very, every nut and bolt about it. Yeah, thank you. I would say um, that I echo what they're saying, what everybody's saying here, because you'll find those who are successful um, in building a pipeline or generating um, an employee base are involved in their community. I mean, Jones has been here for 80 years, so they're very dedicated to their community. And beyond just working with high school students, they also, you know, put back into the Children's Museum of Southern Minnesota. So there's exhibits there that allow young children, you know, ages three and probably even below to interact with different pieces of equipment or see things that they wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Um, so being a part of your community and spending those dollars and being visual like Jasmine is saying, I think is crucial to success, especially in these times. You need your name out there. You need to be seen. You need to be heard. Um, you know, they also, Jones also supports our welding lab up at South Central. It's the Jones Metal Welding Lab. So the more you're involved in your community, and giving back and being philanthropic, um, it really does pay dividends um, to building your workforce. Excellent. And I don't know if our organizers want me to save the chat questions until later, but there's one here that seems relevant to where we are in the conversation. So I'll just um, use executive privilege here to uh, to ask it. Uh, Stacy says, we've spent time talking about teens and youth, but what about the more seasoned workers? Um, you know, in addition to getting in front of the young people, how do we expose uh, incumbent workers to what their future could look like and, and opportunities to get excited about what you all have to offer? I can speak on that. Um, our average tenure here at Jones is over 14 years. And last year, or actually this last summer, we had two gentlemen retire with 45 years of experience apiece. So 90 years walked out the door on the same day. We just take the time to offer incumbent worker program training. I mean, because technology technology is changing, we have to upskill our entire workforce if we want to stay relevant. So we always make sure that we're including our, our incumbent workforce in these opportunities. Um, some are more receptive than others, um, but we also utilize our more experienced operators um, and engineers to help teach and build our training programs, which keeps them engaged as well. I mean, because if they have a say in how we're going to um, apply our training or how we're going to introduce new products or what products we're going to purchase, right? So I don't run a press break, but we have lots of press breaks. It'd be silly for me to just go purchase a press break. So we pull our team together. We ask for their input. What programs do they like? So there, I think there's a lot of ways to keep your skilled and your longer term um, employees engaged just by offering, whether it's cross training, upskilling, input into what you're offering, um, and input into what you're bringing into your facility. Thanks, Dal. Um, other panelists, does that ring true for you as well, or anything to add? Well, hearing none there on that one. Um, Len, I wonder if we could invite you in here. Um, as a workforce board chair and leader in, in Southwest Minnesota, we've had the chance to actually learn from you uh, in this venue in the past. 
uh, and your commitment to equity and inclusion has left a lasting legacy in the organizations that you've been a part of. Could you um, tell us more about some of the strategies that you've used in that domain, uh, as well as outcomes resulting from your strategies? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I said, my main experience comes from working at JBS, very diverse workforce. Um, easy to get a job there if you don't speak English, but not very easy to get promoted into a leadership or management role. Um, so one of the first things that I realized coming into that plant is, is all of those different languages um, that are that the employees that the employees spoke were not all over the place. They weren't on signs, they weren't they weren't communicated out well. So a lot of the things that we put into place was let's let's recognize that. Other languages are beautiful and they are worthy. And so we started just taking like the 10 or 15 management expectations from safety, from quality, from how we treat each other, from our values. And we had them translated into about 13 or 14 different uh, main languages and posted them out on some, um, some pictures and on the wall. The employees thought that was wonderful um, that, that, you know, after all of these years, we're finally uh, they're talking to us in our own language. We took it a step further because we learned not everybody could read. So we took it a step further and did some videos and had some interpreters and we got some of the same information on a touch screen TV, pretty basic, um, and, and just got some good messages out there and was being inclusive of their language, celebrating their cultures. And um, the next step is we had to look and see how do we make our leadership in the plant and in the community more reflective of who's working and living here. And I know when I first started, we had one female supervisor. We had one Asian supervisor, two African and six Hispanic and the rest were Caucasian. Um, from HR, it didn't look a whole lot different. So we put to work and, and focused on building that and, and identifying folks that uh, could, it could, could, become a supervisor and supervisor training programs that were bilingual, that were leaders in their communities. And we wanted to change that message is you don't have to be a male and you don't have to be white just to become a supervisor or manager. Anyone can do this. And so we put that infrastructure in place. And, you know, five years later, we had, we had five female supervisors. We had three African, three Asian and nine Hispanic. And what that did was open the floodgates where people were applying for, they were going to ESL classes, they were going to um, ABE classes so that they could get ready for that next step into their career. So it really changed the outcome um, right there into the plant. And then also into the community, getting the, the second and third generation, their children that they brought over um, that are bilingual, we're growing up in the schools to start running for offices and start running for things around for city leadership and getting involved in the boards so that there's a bigger voice into the community and into the plant. Um, it changed the whole dynamic and it's, it's, it's going very well. Took that into um, High Life, which um, what, it was a kind of a short lift. It was about a three year plan and just recently closed as you, you may be aware. Um, but started doing a lot of that work there as well. And then here um, I'm with Ren up, up in Renville. So it's another hour and a half north of where I'm from, um, which is predominantly Caucasian, some bilingual Hispanic, but it's the same thing. There's a great workforce out there. We've got to find some career paths. We've got to, we've got to knock down the barriers and find folks that can, they, they can work here that don't speak English and, and create programs that they can get involved with so that if they do want to become a supervisor or manager, um, we've got the ABE, the ESL, and all those types of, of uh, programs. Being on the Workforce Development Board, that's the main reason I've been on that board is to make sure that our regions have those types of programs available so that the, the diverse and immigrant groups that are coming to this area have an opportunity for themselves and their children to uh, to grow and learn and and actually stay into the region. Glenn, that's an inspiring uh, recap of the progress you've made. It almost sounds like it was easy, and I'm sure it can't have been. I mean, what did you encounter any bumps along the way? Well, yeah, I mean, change is hard, and, and I don't care how long <laughs> the, how long the uh, 
the plant has been there. Change is hard, but you, you have to you have to just give it your best shot. You have to keep at it. You have to keep showing the value of the workforce. You know, with 2,200 employees, you can't tell me that there's not a dozen really smart, talented, educated folks that are working on that line that aren't completely bilingual. And as a matter of fact, one of the first supervisors that we we brought into a supervisory um, the supervisory um, training program it was a gentleman from Ethiopia, and his job was sticking the hogs to bleed out. And in this interview process, we find out he's got a he's got a master's degree in Ethiopia for urban development. So this is a highly educated man and very motivated and just given the opportunity, he's probably one of the best supervisors they have in that plant right now. And so we knew identifying him, there were many, many more and we went out and we found him and encouraged him. Excellent. Well, do any of the other panelists have um, observations about their own efforts and, and progress in this space of kind of building an inclusive and diverse workforce? I mean, I, it's hard to follow that because that's awesome. But um, I mean, I guess mine is more general as far as that actions speak louder than words. Um, you, you, you'll you see and you hear that there a lot of this is community involvement. That's kind of like a common theme that I'm hearing right now. Obviously, that's a big thing that I'm talking about. Um, but a lot of it is just I focus on supporting groups and getting known that I am, I guess, essentially an ally. Um, anything from minorities, women, um, veterans, or any other group that gets tend to be left out, um, whether personally or professionally, I try to attend these events. I try to be seen that I'm, you know, I'm there. The company has its name on things, but a lot of it is, it's not just that we're supporting financially as a sponsor or something. Um, it might be providing other resources or time, um, but um, like, for example, one of my favorite organi organizations that is not maybe as well known compared to some of these bigger ones would be like Bio Girls. It's a, a Midwest group that essentially uh, encourages young girls to um, be empowered. And um, I, I like those initiatives because we need more things like that. And it when I'm trying to help out with things like that, they can view that as almost, I don't know. A, I'm, I'm struggling to find the words, but um, basically just that you need to do what you what you say you're doing and you need to make it known that you are a welcoming, you're a safe space and that while I might not have all the answers um, because there are problem, things that you'll need to problem solve with any change, um, that you'll be actively working towards progress. Yeah, one of the comments in the chat is that actions speak louder than words, and that I think is true. Matt, Matt yes. Hall, Andy Wells here. Uh, I just had a, another comment following up on what was just said. Uh, I found out in building a diverse workforce that it really helps if it's driven from the top down, because if if you don't start with the top, uh, you're going to get pushback on any of these kind of things that we're trying, whether it's language or the color of the skin or whatever the custom and, and the ethnic uh, issue might be, uh, it's got to come really from the top. The top has to be on board because when the pushback comes, the top can hang in there and and keep keep things going in the right direction. Uh, so getting the upper management on, on board with this kind of thing is really important. And the more we can share our stories and bring the leaders into our way of thinking, uh, I think the more successful this effort will be. So I just wanted to make that little comment that uh, that's what we've done. And now in our community where typically there's only 5% native uh, employment and whether it's government or business, whatever, that's pretty typical, you're 5%. We've uh, moved ours up to 30% or more uh, just because we focus on this and we make an effort to do this. And we've even gone beyond that. We've taken some of our production equipment and went right into a poverty area and set up a, in a building there, a training center. And we brought some of our best people in for doing the training 
uh, and doing the mentoring. And it's really made a difference because now the local people there who normally didn't think of themselves as uh, industrial employees uh, can just walk almost to our training center just within a mile or less. And the, and they can get accustomed to that. So there's a lot of little things that can be done for companies who want to make their company more diverse and more inclusive of uh, the region's uh, population. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, this is these are exactly the kinds of, I think, inspiring ideas that are the purpose of a conversation like this to to get some creativity around what else we can try to uh, to make progress. Um, another comment and question that I see in the chat uh, that there's been some dialogue on comes from Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, he says, I think this is back to maybe um, Len's uh, earlier comments. Interesting topic on efforts to help increase diversity among supervisors. I'm curious what companies are seeing among skilled automation positions, especially if the programs make written English more important. Any panelists have thoughts on that? Can you repeat uh, yeah. that last part? Sorry. Um, curious what companies are seeing among skilled automation positions and if the programs make written English more important. I can comment on that, Matt, because we, we use a lot of automation, high tech equipment in our production of aerospace components. And uh, what we find is we got to be really careful. We can bring people on board and build this inclusiveness and diversity diverse employment, but a lot of them get stuck there at the beginning level. And we have to be very conscious of always upskilling everybody. Uh, the equipment every year becomes more advanced. So even our very top people and operators and machinists and so on, engineers have to continually be upskilled also. Uh, but that re goes right down to the beginners. We can't just bring them on board and then leave them there. We got to make sure we take time from our production people or whoever is going to do the training to keep bringing these people upward in their training and skills and knowledge uh, otherwise. And actually, that'll help with retention, too, because that's one of the main elements that keeps people on board uh, and feeling important is the fact that they're being upskilled and valued. So you have to do it throughout the whole company. Thank you. And Matt, if I could just add on to that, I think the biggest barrier is most programs and documents are all written in English and most management is they're, they're only English speaking. So it's hard for companies to wanna to bring somebody um, that is diverse and, does, and English isn't their first language into those levels. When it really it's a pretty easy transition as far as the infrastructure of getting documents translated, getting supervisors and managers that are bilingual in places so that you can communicate and it's all written together. It's not a far stretch and it's well worth the work, uh, but it, it, it does take a while. Thanks. Um, Andy mentioned upscaling a moment ago. Val, a question I had for you. Um, Jones Metal Products is known across the state for being willing to share best practices and successes in utilizing um, dual pipeline and work-based learning strategies. Could you tell us anything about how the programs have helped uh, you to strengthen workforce and, and decrease turnover, increase retention, et cetera? Yeah, I, Pipeline's been huge for us. So um, we were the first I think, company in the state to utilize Pipeline um, here in Mankato. We had a lot of help from our um, training provider, uh, South Central College here. Um, in utilizing that program, it works really well with our relationship with the high schools um, like I mentioned, I sit on the advisory council for our manufacturing um, boards in the high school. And there's a group of us in Mankato that are really active. Um, but the way Pipeline has specifically helped us is we then partner with our high schools and take interns every year, um, mostly in welding, although we do take machining and mechatronics. And welding right now seems to be um, the most successful for us. But um, we'll have two to four interns um, each year, so like two a semester or, you know, a half year. And then in the springtime, those who worked out the best or that showed the most aptitude or, um, you know, those soft skills on being on time, willing to collaborate, things like that. We offered them full time employment through the summer and then um, roll them into pipeline grant funds while they train up at South Central and then work at Jones Metal. So we have had 
um, 16 successful um, employees in this area. So we've sent 16 people through school. We've got a couple in now. Um, and it really has literally built us a pipeline. So students talk to their peers, um, the counselors at the school see what we're doing. So oftentimes they'll give us some of their best students to roll into these programs, which then really has developed a pipeline for us um, to keep growing our um, employee base. Um, so yeah, we also offer it to all of our um, incumbent employees as well. So when we go every year to apply for pipeline, we communicate to everybody. We're applying for pipeline, who's interested, who wants to participate. We've had, um, I'd say, almost equal numbers of um, incumbent employees and new hires participate in it. So it really is a great program. I think sometimes people are hesitant to get involved because they think it's a lot of work. Um, and that's where I jumped in to you know, help other companies explain to them what we do. And as long as you've got a, a good training partner, it, it's not real difficult to put these programs together and it really does pay dividends in the end. And for anyone who might not be as familiar, could you even just give us the basics of what it consists of? Yeah, so pipeline, I mean, it's, it's a grant opportunity, right? Where the employer applies for grant funds to um, basically educate and upskill um, employees, or I think they really focus on um, new high school graduates to bring people into the fields. There's a variety of fields about focusing on manufacturing. Um, pipeline has a list of careers um, and they add to those careers and as long as you're manufacturing based, and it can be from a welder to like a process engineer. It doesn't have to be a two year um, career. There's supervisory programs for manufacturing supervisors. There's logistics. There's all sorts of careers under pipeline that you can get grant funds for to put people through school. So if you have a supervisor that maybe needs some upskilling, you can get up to six thousand uh, dollars per grant. I'm sorry, six thousand dollars per employee or um, student and then get that up to four times so up to twenty four thousand dollars to um, put towards somebody's education. It's the employer who applies for the grant funds and is awarded, um, but then is able to reimburse themselves for paying for tuition and things of that nature. Excellent, thank you. And I see Jody and our team has also flagged uh, the Minnesota Job Skills Partnership Program as being a somewhat related uh, and promising opportunity that I think Jones has um, participated in. So that's a good one too. Uh, and hopefully as you're hearing about all these, you'll be um, inspired to dig in and learn more about what the details are. But the good news is uh, you have fellow manufacturers right here that have shown that they can be accessed effectively. I would also yeah, encourage Oh, I'm sorry. The incumbent worker program, the incumbent worker program, um, those dollars, those funds are amazing. Um, if you want to talk about engaging your incumbent workforce or for very specialized training, when you get that new piece of equipment in and you know your local community college doesn't offer training for that and you need training specifically for that machine, you can get help with that as well. So there's there's lots of funds out there if the employers are willing to look and um, just be a little resourceful. And I and I'll piggyback on that and say, you know, there's all these programs out there. And during my expansion, I wasn't aware of what even existed. Um, some of it is jaw dropping on the amount of money that you can get back um, for growing your workforce during an expansion or um, putting forth training. And and I would say that while we're upskilling all of our employees, you can't just throw even someone who's been in your company for 15 years and say, okay, you're the next supervisor. You can't just throw them into that role. I mean, um, in order to set anybody up for success, whether, you know, any, it doesn't matter if they're diverse or not, it, we need to make sure that our employees are um, confident and able to do their jobs. Um, so for example, I knew that my, a lot of my shop heads um, in recent years, I've brought them up um, into those positions, but they were lacking in maybe some more of the computer skills, um, things like Microsoft Office and Excel, particularly Excel. And I knew that they could make their jobs easier and more effective and that they would be more confident in the work that they did. Um, so I reached out and I don't even remember what program I used, but um, I basically said, hey, this is what I'm kind of thinking about for training. I would like to team up with maybe the local college and do some sort of Excel course. Can we figure something out to tailor um, training for this as well as is there any resources out there to help cover some of this expense? And I would say more often than not, someone's able to find me some money and a way to do it where it's not going to all fall on me. 
but it benefits both the company and the workers, and it proves to your employees that uh, you're willing to invest in them as well. Well said. Thank you very much. And I see now we have reached the 12 o'clock hour, so you're probably all getting hungry. And also, this is the point where we wanted to transition uh, from this discussion part of the conversation into the, uh, the so-called unplugged portion, where I'm going to hand over to my colleague Della in just a moment to run that piece. But before we do, uh, I feel like I've learned a ton and I've been inspired by some of the promising practices that we've heard from our fellow manufacturers here. I'm not a manufacturer, but you know what I mean. Uh, could we please take a moment and uh, share a round of applause for our great busy panelists who took the time to share their expertise with us today. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner, for leading this uh, very engaging roundtable discussion. Um, I am Della Ludwig. I am the Workforce Strategy Consultant for Central Minnesota. I'm going to take over at this point. Um, like uh, Commissioner said, we are going to do a um, little bit more of an uh, unplug session at this point. Um, but before we get there, we're going to go ahead and do a couple little housekeeping items. So first, I just want to go ahead and remind you of next month. Uh, on November 1st, we are going to be talking about navigating the international hiring process. So James uh, Whirlwind Soldier will be leading that discussion next month, and it is going to be focusing on the process of identifying, attracting, and onboarding employees from around the world. So you will be able to join in and hear from a panel of employers and subject matter experts on promising practices to enhance your workforce. So join us on November 1st for that discussion. And then please take a minute to complete our survey on how we can continue to grow our Workforce Wednesday events. Uh, for you. Uh, as we discussed at the beginning, we are building our 2024 Workforce Wednesday schedule and we'll, would love to hear from you on your suggestions. Uh, so complete the survey and let us know how we can make our next year's events even better. Um, we'll begin our unplugged session uh, in just a minute uh, where we will turn off the recording, unmute our mics, and turn on the cameras to have an open conversation with all of our panelists. Uh, so at this time, we will stop the recording um, and unmute everybody and turn on the cameras. <laughs> 